the Kennedy assassination opened the door to one of the most painful, wrenching periods in America's history. Almost overnight, youngsters who once marched with pride on the 50-50 Club were now marching in protest. The nation's upheaval would soon be mirrored by the personal turmoil that began to engulf Ruth Lyons. And I remember, uh, I think most vividly, uh, was kind of the, uh, the soap opera that her life became later in her career. After a long battle with cancer, Ruth's sister, Rose Lupton, died in June of 1964. Just before Christmas, Ruth suffered a stroke, impairing her speech. Then, only three weeks after Ruth's release from the hospital, her daughter Candy was diagnosed with breast cancer. I mean, that was just such too much on her after that stroke. I mean, that just put her so far behind. After six months of recuperation and therapy, Ruth and Candy returned to the 50-50 Club. Thank you all so much. I'm so glad to see you all. I'm glad I made it. I made it. I made it. I made it. Yeah, Ruth was back, but not back to normal. Oh, it was, it was challenging. We'd speak every word under our breath, you know, with her, because she had trouble getting the words out, you know. And uh, it, was, it was heartbreaking, it really was. No one really came out and said that, you know, this is what has happened, she's had a stroke, she's having difficulty talking. That was uh, difficult to watch, uh, because e even as a kid, you kind of knew that it likely didn't have a, a, a happy outcome. Candy's failing health forced the star to take another leave of absence from her show. Ruth and Herman tried to provide their daughter with one final overseas trip before time ran out. Ladies and gentlemen, by now I'm sure you have all heard the very sad and terrible news about the untimely passing of Candy Newman. Candy was like a sister to me. She was a wonderful little girl who really never had a chance to fulfill her life. She was strength to her mother. She was her helping hand when she needed her. And she was about as brave a little girl as I have ever known in my life. And a wonderful, charming little girl. And she'll be deeply missed by all of us and by all of you. By October, Ruth Lyons was in front of the cameras once again. And everybody has trouble, you know. Everybody has problems. And of course, that's the hard part to keep on going. But you have to try. And I'm going to try real hard. I don't know whether I'll make it every day, Bobby. I'll let you and Peter get on here someday and carry on, or you and Nick or something. Okay. But I'll come as often as I can. Is that all right with you? That's wonderful. Good. Thank you. But friends and colleagues continued to worry about her condition. It was, a, it was a really sad time because I think everyone realized her physical health was not, she, she really shouldn't be doing that. But, you know, how do, how do you stop being Ruth Lyons? How do you not do what you've done all those years? I walk in her office and with Mike, and she says hi to Mike, and she looks at me, and she really doesn't know who I am. And I went over and gave her a big hug, and then she, you're George. I said, yes, I am. And she hugged me, but she was sort of trembling. She was, and she never trembled. <laughs> but she, I knew then it was not going to last very long. She was only back on the air a short time. But, uh, yeah, she didn't know who I was. and. I'd been with her every day for 10 years. <laughs> but she wanted to come back and raise the Christmas fund in memory of Candy, and that's what she did. The 1966 campaign was the most successful in the fund's 27-year history, but it gave little comfort to its founder. 
Stepping out on stage to greet a special friend, Ruth Lyons was carrying a secret burden. The knowledge that she was about to end a remarkable 48-year career. I didn't realize it, but I knew she had had a stroke. And that, that, that really uh, emotionally got me. I had no idea that she would have to stop. You know, I was very pleased when I heard something you know today. What? A great friend of mine has come to see me. Really? Mm -hmm. Miss Carol Channing. Look, if I can go see the first lady on the only day I've got, I certainly can go see the first lady of television, Ruth Lyles. Oh, thank you. Nice. You've been such a good friend, Carol. Oh, Ruth. We always will be. We always will be. Then, Ruth's mood began to darken. She was starting to shake, and she was fragile in my hands. And when she started to cry, I was holding her hand, and, and she was beginning to disintegrate right under me. And I held both her hands and talked to her the best way I could, the, the way I thought my father would talk to me if my son died, you know? No, Ruth, now we're good enough. Ruth, we're always together, forever. I know. Yes, that's right, that's right. I mean, I knew she needed help at that moment. This is good for you, little Ruth. Not all the time, though. And I could help her because I didn't know. And she was helpless because she did know. She knew it was one of her last broadcasts. As I'm sure you know, this is the most difficult letter I have written in my life, but one that I can postpone no longer. Bobby, I must ask you to tell the audience of 5050 Club that for reasons of personal health, I can no longer continue with the show. My doctor has advised me to retire. I am following his advice. I hope you will forgive me for not being on the show today, but I have never liked to say goodbye. This gallery of pained and tear-stained faces would serve as the final images of the Ruth Lyons era, frozen in time under the glassy eye of a TV picture tube. Unlike many performers, her retirement remained definite and absolute. She lived quietly, occasionally seeing old friends, while coping with two decades of steadily declining health. What purpose, what mission drives a person to take on the high wire act of live and you can't take it back television till she simply isn't physically or emotionally capable of taking another step? Perhaps the answer is this. People were important to Ruth Lyons, not as an audience, but as individuals. When she insisted on trying an advertiser's product before promoting it on her program, the message was clear, respect me, respect my ladies. She could have adopted the genial, inoffensive, middle-of-the-road mask of women in early TV. Instead, by being so assertively, so unapologetically herself, Mother became a mirror, a glass in which all of us could see our own quirky, imperfect selves. I'm Nancy James. Now, who do you think of when you hear? They never let me sing. 
And who gets toys for girls and boys that Santa Claus can bring? And who is it more than anyone loves Paris in the spring? That's Ruth. Ain't it the truth? A 90-minute daily visit out along the line. On radio or television, either one is fine. To listen to a lady who is always 29, that's Ruth. Ain't it the truth? Now she may sit and talk about the world situation, or she may rise and even preach a sermon. But when she leaves the studio and heads for home each night, her heart belongs to Herman. Now you may search the whole world through to every nook and cranny, Never will you ever find a lady so uncanny Who's younger and prettier than little orphan Annie <laughs> Ain't it the truth? Yeah. You got a handy 